All right, welcome everybody. Hudson Valley Guild of Mental Health is happy to present Eric Frazier in a somatic awareness event. Take it away. All right, hi everyone, good to see you. Nice to be with all of you this evening, um, to see new faces, some familiar faces. And, um, you know, for me, a lot of, I really, I wanna share my work with you. And I also really want a chance for, you know, for you to get to know me a little better as well. Um, just to be more involved with the guild and so that we know but more about each other's work and so on. Um, yeah, well, well, I do a blend of music therapy and talk therapy. And my orientation is now with somatic experiencing work and attachment work as well. So I found a way to do these modalities as well and to bring it um, into my music therapy work as well. But I also do you know, traditional talk methods as well, but music therapy is um, what my master's is in. I have a license in creative arts therapy. So music is a big part of how I work with clients. Um, the method of somatic attachment work that I'm surf, I'm trained in is called DARE. Maybe you're familiar with this. It's called the Dynamic Attachment Repatterning Experience. It's based on the work of Diane Poole Heller. Um, this, uh, this is a, 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 um, a hybrid of somatic experiencing and attachment work. And um, I, I got certified in this method this year. Um, it really opened my, it opened me up to, to working with clients in a whole lot of really impactful, uh, impactful ways. Um, for most of my 20 year career, I've been a music centered music therapist. And that means that I was almost always music based, music focused, um, working with children. That was with children with autism and other development disorders and also children in foster care. Um, but after I was licensed in 2020, I opened my work to include psychotherapy for adults. So the way I use sound and music for children differs a lot from how I use it with adults, but and I'll go into both of those today. Um, but to begin with, my music therapy principles are the same for working with children and working with adults. So I'd like to jump right in and share a bit about my principles. Um, my principle number one, everyone can be in music and do musical activities. No one needs to be a musician. Musical activity is inherent to human nature. Okay, whether or not we know it, we are utilizing rhythm, we create melody, we utilize variations in sound for meaning and communication, and even to care for ourselves. Even in the way that we speak, we use prosody, right? To which to me has a musical, is like a musical activity. So I think it's important to just think of your own idea of what music is, and then realize that you can really expand your palette in terms of what doing musical activity means. So, you know, banging on something is a musical activity. You know, taking a sigh, like, ah, is a musical activity because it's expressive and it's using sound. So bringing clients into being musical um, can mean a whole lot, can really mean um, more, much more than you might have thought it before. Um, so using, you know, expression in sound is really baked into this first principle. Um, whoops, where did I go? The myths, uh, the myths associated with this is that music is only for performance and aesthetic enjoyment. Okay, actually, it can be so much more than that. I think a lot of people shy away from being musical because they think that it's supposed to, well, maybe sound like music <laughs> or sound like something that's supposed to be for enjoyment. Um, many people have experienced being told that they don't sound good or that they don't sing well. And these are things that are myths as far as your ability and right essentially your birthright to be involved in music. So musical activity doesn't need to sound like music. The truth is 
that releasing sound and relating to sound is a survival and coping mechanism that is hardwired into everyone. And in fact, after studying the psychology of music, I learned a lot um, about the, the orientation of language in human history and how prosody and communication developed. Okay, and language itself arose from a music, a musical part of our, of our, um, basically our, our basic human wiring. Um, so it's really interesting also how the musical part of our brain is really deeply seated. And that even when there's significant cognitive decline, as in like dementia or Alzheimer's, that the musical processing parts of the brain remain healthy and intact. So a lot of times we can work with people cognitive decline and once they get involved in singing or playing, they really can come alive and they can relate again. And they can also even remember lyrics to songs and things that, that they enjoyed throughout their lives. You know, even when they don't really remember a lot of other things. So what we'll do today to start, well, I'm going to have you do a little experiential um, from the beginning um, right now. And then I'll talk more about my work with children after this. So actually, my orientation to music um, is quite eclectic. And so I play guitar, I play piano, um, I create recordings, I work with hip hop, I work with beats, and I also play Indian classical music, which is actually where my deepest training is. And I lived and studied music in India for like uh, all together. Over the course of 15 years, I spent about seven years there learning music um, traditionally. And I play the flute of India. Um, and Indian music itself uh, has just really made, made me um, be able to utilize the power of, of tone and melody to give people a meditative and somatic experience in which they can start to, you know, it's, a, it's like a tool essentially to help people to connect to tone and even simple melody. So the way we'll work today is I'll start with a simple flute meditation and then we'll do a little vocalizing. Okay, and during that part, you're welcome to leave I would the beginning part we will leave your mics off and then there will be an opportunity uh, later on for you to unmute yourself. Um, so to begin with a meditation. I'll just ask you to find a comfortable seat. Just kind of notice the quality of your breath. Try not to force anything and just to be aware of the quality of your breath right now. No need to push your breath into, you know, taking a deep breath, but just an easy breath, whatever, it, however that comes for you. And just noticing how your seat is firmly planted where you are. And as I play the flute for a few minutes, I would invite you to try and explore the balance between being aware of and connected with the music and being aware of and connected with yourself. And if you find yourself being overly absorbed in the music, that's okay. Um, but, you know, to remember to take note of that. And if you find yourself being really in yourself and not really being able to connect with the music to notice that as well. And every experience is okay. So I'm going to turn on a drone, which I love to use drones because they provide like a carpet of sound for us to feel supported by and it brings resonance 
out of the tones that we sing and play. It highlights the resonance of the tone because it's being supported by a drone. We're trying to notice if the music supports the meditation. We're also noticing if emotions can be spoken to, if emotions can be called upon in the here and now to create the possibility of having these emotions be in a supported and then worked through together with the therapist. So now we have an opportunity to bring that tone into our bodies, to be aware of how the tone resonates within our bodies, which is the beginning of the somatic experience of sound. So there's two ways of using the voice in this way. One is by singing, and another is by toning. So toning is a little different from singing because we're not really in this for music. We're in this for singing tones and holding them for long durations. And the thing about holding a note for a long time is that we can really um, just become absorbed in it. And it essentially really helps to become fully present, to have a feeling of being here in, in the present moment. The long tones really harness the focus of the mind in the here and now. 
So when we're doing this, there are some areas of the body that I'm suggesting that you focus on feeling the sensation of, of the toning in. At first, we have the throat area. We have the chest. There's face. And you can even feel it in your scalp, in your head. So these are the three areas we'll focus on to keep it simple. And now there are three notes, only three notes that we'll explore. And in Indian music, we call these Ni Sa and Re. Ni Sa Re. Now I'll sing a phrase and you can repeat it back in your own place. Ni Sa Re. Ni re sa Ni re ni Ni sa Okay, so this is the small territory that we'll stay in. And we're going to use tones now with I and M with the M. The I sound gives us the chance to go really feel those vibrations in the throat and the chest. And the M sound gives us the chance to feel the vibrations in our face. So I'll sing a phrase and you can sing it with me or wait for me and I'll give you a chance to sing it by yourself. I'll move slowly and leave a little bit of space. I... Lastly, you have a chance to do this together with me. You don't have to turn on your mic, but if you want to join together and make a sound together, we can do that together now.
Wow, beautiful to hear your voices. And so you may have noticed that you have a different quality of breath after doing that. You may notice that while doing those tones, you were able to feel a little more into the subtle vibration and subtle sensations within your body. Okay, and this is a doorway. This is a doorway to asking our clients to feel something. And so a lot of times what I might do next is actually work on, let's make whatever sound you feel like now. So we'll, we'll get rid of these constraints and we'll just do whatever and really help the client to feel comfortable trying to make sounds that feel, just feel like that's what they feel like making, in other words. Could be growling, snarling, laughing, could be so many different kinds of tones. So that's a really simple, basic experience of using sound to develop somatic awareness. What's also really happening in this? Let's take a look. Um, we have respiratory changes while singing or toning. Because this con continuously stable air pressure while using voice for toning will automatically create a deeper inhalation. So a lot of times our clients might, we might say, ask them to take a deep breath or try to help them to take a deep breath. And sometimes it's like, I don't wanna take a deep breath or I can't take a deep breath or that's too much for me. And so it should be an easy breath. And how to help somebody to develop that easier breath? It should come automatically, a deeper breath. So doing a little bit of toning or singing. Um, if a client doesn't want to do toning because it feels too abstract or it feels weird to them, you might just sing a song, even karaoke, something that allows them to do that kind of vocalization for a moment. Brings them a step closer to deepening the inhalation and beginning to be able to drop into the body. And the somatic awareness part, we have opportunity because it's ripples of sound vibration, that the voice inside the body is creating vibration. So we can ask our clients where they feel it. That gives them agency first. We're not suggesting anything. We're actually asking you them, where do you feel it? And for some clients, they're, they're already going to have answers. Some of them will need guidance. And so we can guide them and we can offer them to feel it in the chest, feel in the abdomen, feel in the throat, the face. And I, I'm highlighting here back body because it's so empowering when we finally realize that we're not only pushing sound forward, but we're, the sound is coming out through all, our whole body and from behind us also. And, you know, it's often said that the body is like 80% water. Well, if you've ever made a sound over water, which I invite you to do tonight, um, a sustained tone like we just did, you'll notice ripples of vibration as they, as they create waves and patterns in the water. So we can really use that sound to bring people into the body and to, to expand subtle awareness throughout the body. And the other beautiful thing about this whole body awareness and this back body awareness, and we can help them with conversations about boundaries, about feeling themselves belonging in their own space, about, you know, differentiating self and other and being able to have a visual experience of that. You know, in attachment work, I've learned, you know, one of the interventions is when a client has, has issues with boundaries and being able to stand up for their own boundaries, they're putting the arms out in front and just saying, no, that this movement itself, and what is this? This is a movement of creating a boundary outside our body, almost an awareness that our bodies are bigger than we're care our vibration and our essence is being is actually a little outside of ourselves too and it helps to visualize that to create a, a more established sense of self and differentiate differentiation from the other 
So moving on a little towards attachment. Um, <clears throat> with music. So beginning with just experiencing a secure connection within the therapeutic relationship is corrective and regulating. Okay, so I believe that a bond between therapist and client is is part of the therapy. Um, it doesn't mean that we should be their friend or you know be parentified or anything like that, but it means that there is a bond and it can be felt by both of us, and it's the result of the music of the synchronization that comes through doing creative play by being musical together um, or just being creative together, moving creatively, that there's a that it actually has scientifically and there's evidence based studies to show this as well that that it, this is how humans actually form connections with each other. So we're people doing therapy, so we will end up feeling a bond ourselves by doing this. And, you know, we can process it in supervision. Um, so, but music stimulates emotion, right? The deep emotions that are part of music, and sometimes it's universal, um, like a sad song. And sometimes it's personal, what arises. And one of the things about working with clients in their song choices, um, maybe asking them what, they, what songs help them feel things um, and, and can connect to them, connect their story to the music. Um, it's good to ask about it. Um, sometimes there's trauma associated with a song. So we never really know. Um, so it's important to ask. The other thing is from this body of evidence based research is that music creates changes in endorphins and hormones and singing, especially so, especially when we continuously sing for about 20 minutes. There will be changes in your in endorphins and hormones that are related to social connection and are related to a feel good mood, which promotes resourcing. Resourcing 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 so important. Um, especially in the somatic work and in the tradition of Peter Levine and somatic experiencing is that pendulation the, um, and the titration of being able to dip our toe into the hard stuff and to come out and to have a resource. And the resource is like the boat, right? Something for us to hold on to and to get on to when we need to, so that we're able to effectively go in to the hard stuff again. And so sometimes the music itself is the resource. And then lastly, making music together can synchronize with and mirror the client. And this is related to bonding also. Synchronizing, doing something together in synchronicity creates a bonding and it's part of human nature. How did I get back there? Sorry, I'm struggling a little bit with the um, PowerPoint uh, flow here, but let's see. Self other balancing. Okay, so we're moving a little further into the attachment stuff. Um, a good relationship, a healthy connection, a secure relationship involves a balance of the self with the other. And so music making provides the opportunity for to help bring awareness to the client about patterns of relating um, and to provide alternate experiences. So examples of relating in music, so playing together. Um, remember, you, people don't have to be a musician, right? Most everyone can go, you know, even play a little beat on a table and do this with me, right? I don't have to be somebody who's super trained to do this or like tap and foot and clap and foot and clap and foot and clap and and foot and clap and gap clap foot and clap and I'm just playing around with this and then looking at how a client a child or adult 
my face or turn away, my overplay or underplay, um, becoming too loud, becoming too soft, conservative or explorational. This is a really um, big one a lot of times um, when I notice, you know, kids improvising with me on the piano, for example, and really only just sticking around like two or three notes. And then there's other kids who are just going all over the keyboard, up and down, um, explorational. So these are ways of relating and these are ways of being together in the moment. So we get that real organic here and now kind of um, interactive play. And so that gives the chance for the therapist to gently, compassionately, skillfully try to make conversation about it or to address it in a way that's really supportive of the client and could promote change or awareness. Being open or resistant, big one. We all felt resistance, I'm sure we know, um, and how difficult that can be. So how to really be supportive of the client and address that resistance at the same time. Uh, I think that's the skill that makes this about being a therapist rather than just someone who's really good at playing music with people. Um, these are the things that make it about being a therapist. Phrases for attachment types. So in working and playing in the music or talking with people, what comes up if it seems that the well, okay, let me backtrack for a moment. The orientation to so the attachment uh, theory is for me that in the way what I learned in my training and what seems really clear to me is that nobody's squarely in any of these styles. Some of us are anxious with some qualities of avoidant. Um, it's somewhat, it's too simple to think that every person falls in one and one only. But um, when, you, when you realize that a client is struggling with anxious attachment, using phrases like, you don't have to give up yourself to be in relationship with me. You know, you don't, you, you can be you. I'm here to care for you. You're in my care right now. Um, if somebody's presenting as more avoidant, you can feel all your feelings. You can embody and feel your body. You have a body. Try this. Try this. Uh, feel this drum on your body. Can you feel that? You can feel that sensation. And giving and encouraging an opportunity for the client to just, you know, to reckon, to to um, ha feel a corrective statement for the attachment place that they're coming from. If someone is disorganized right, maybe has experienced a lot of trauma in relational trauma, um, come presenting as very disorganized, oscillating between avoidant and anxious. Really simple things like I'm paying attention to you and showing that in the music, letting them feel that attention and then observing, like, how do they respond to that? Maybe that actually causes them to be to act avoidantly. Well, that's a good note for the therapist to take. How can we strike a balance so that we can actually model even for the 45 minutes or whatever that we're spending with the client, 45 minutes to an hour, that they get a sense of having an experience of a secure, of feeling secure, which gives them a reduction in anxiety and gives them the opportunity to feel secure. And then let me give you clear directions. Sometimes, Clients don't want to be directed, and it's important to allow them to be creative and free play. But if they're if the disorganized, if, it does, if there's some disorganization showing up, yeah, that's when it's the important for the therapist to come in and say, I might say something like, um, "Feel this when we sing. Try to feel it in your throat." Or here, let's play. Take this drum, hold it like this. 
And here, play this drum pattern. Can you hold that? Good, there you go. That's the thing, giving actual clear, clear direction. All right, so uh, I'm gonna jump into talking about working with children now. Um, ritual and review as secure attachment. So this is, you know, from the attachment perspective, um, creating that structure is key. And yes, it's really as simple as just the kid knows what they're coming, what's going to happen, and that helps them to relax. So all the creativity and all the improv improv improvising and so on can happen in the session. But to begin the session, a hello song, simple and familiar, and I use it every time. And I can make changes for special occasions, like I might jazz it up for Christmas or a birthday or something. Um, but then in the session, recreating. So if we have themes from during a session that arise, that it's my work to, to try and remember them. And if I can't record a session, I really have to, you know, try to remember that and maybe put it on my voice memo after the session so that I can intentionally bring it back during the next session. A good example, I have a client, a, a child with autism. I'm gonna grab my hand drum over here. We had a song that arose um, that gave us so much opportunity to work on many of her issues, including perseveration um, and hand flapping and all the things that, that she's coming into the session with. Um, and it was just a thing, a little thing that just started happening between us where it's like drums are for playing and drums are safe. Drums are for playing every day. Let's all play the drum and we can have some fun. Drums are for playing every day. And doing this and doing this, she's really repeating me, staying in the rhythm. I see her body getting organized by the repetition. All right, in the next session, I brought it back. And this time, instead of having her hold one, uh, instead of letting, well, the next session I came back and I encouraged her to get both of her hands involved in the playing. Because usually one hand is doing this. Okay, so this time I said, drums are for playing with two hands. Drums are for playing every day. And we, we got her focusing on using two hands and then the, the uh, perseverative energy goes to her legs. Um, she starts jumping uncontrollably, but she's not doing this anymore. Okay, so then using the rhythm, I stand up and I start modeling, you know, moving, bouncing to the rhythm without jumping too much and keeping the whole body engaged in the rhythmic activity. And, you know, for her only, for her, that 20 minutes of regulation was, I'm sure it was quite, um, it felt great to have that kind of full somatic experience, full body regulation. And, you know, it carries outside of the session for some time, um, but, you know, it doesn't stick, you know, she doesn't leave the session and then she's regulated, you know, she comes back and she does the session and She's not regulated all week because of it, but it's something, at least for some time during the session. And lastly, reviewing. So I love to review the session within the goodbye song to ask, what did we do today? And then we sing back everything we did. All right, and I'm gonna share a little video with you of, of the, that, uh, the child I was just telling you about. I'm gonna share a video um there we go and this is totally hipaa compliant because the agency posted it to facebook so they had all of the permissions it's just 11 seconds but you can i think you can see us here that's me that's her both wearing our masks this was only a few weeks ago all right here's a little clip from the goodbye song
Okay. So the musicking is a verb that we like to use in in, uh, in music therapy in the music center. Whoops, let me turn it off. It automatically went to another video. Um, musicking, musicking, eating, singing, drinking, sleeping, musicking. It's just an action. It's just a way of being. Other ways of working with children. Um, a little from a case study. So uh, a, a child I'll call Tommy, a four-year-old, um, born extremely prematurely. Um, so really big difficulties with somatic and pragmatic, I mean, sorry, pragmatic communication. Pragmatically, social and pragmatic communication. Um, even for a four-year-old, and look, I have two kids right now. One is three, the other is six. Kids are self-centered, but this child really has difficulty um, with even just simple actions of, of you know, cooperating and playing together with others. So um, I used improvisation to try to find a way to create some real time interaction between us, musical improvisation. And it was when I started throwing in storytelling that I found a, a real pathway to engagement with the child in which we co-created something together. Um, this began because the, the child whom I'll call Tommy was perseverating on chimes. So I had put out some chimes and he was just swiping them really loudly and then grabbing them and doing this kind of thing and just really just perseverating on it. Um, not very nice sound for the ears. Um, if you've ever heard someone swat at some chimes, it's not, uh, it's not the best, but so I, jumped into a storytelling experience, partly because this kid is incredibly literate. It's amazing how literate he is. He can read really well. Um, so I thought maybe he likes this kind of way of, th that this would be a good creative avenue for us. Um, so when I started the storytelling, I first said, once there was a cricket, and I don't know why I chose a cricket, but I think it was the first thing that came to my mind because I didn't want to use the, sto the, um, the actual animal from the story because I didn't want to stick to strictly to the original story, which is a Native American tale called Jumping Mouse. Um, this, so the cricket, and then the cricket hears a sound that no one else can hear is the way the story starts. The cricket hears a sound that no one else can hear, which already touches in on that Tommy experiences the world differently already. He's sensitivity to sound. He has sensitivity to light. He has sensitivity to so many things. And so he really hears things and differently than other people. And that kind of already puts it right into what's relevant to him. Um, once there was a cricket and then I handed him the chimes again and I said, the sound the cricket hears is far away and soft. Let's make that sound on the chime. And that's when he started doing it extremely mindfully and delicately. And I said, the cricket needs an instrument. Let's try the kabasa. And I handed him the, the scraping Latin thing where you scrape and it sounds like um, and so I handed him the instrument and I said whenever we whenever we say cricket you need to play this so he has it in his hand and he gets to be the cricket right without me saying it's you um, Tommy was paying very close attention his attention became completely focused on me um, and then we acted out where the cricket goes to find out what the sound is. 
And on the way, he meets another character who he gets to ask for help to take him to the sound. So the character's a raccoon. And we act it out musically too. So the whole time I'm on the on the keyboard, you know. Kind of trying to make this um, fantasy world. And we get a ride on the raccoon with the cricket and we go to find where that sound source is. And it turns out it's a river. Well, what happens? The cricket is so excited that he falls into the water. All right, so once again, Cricket needs to ask for help. And this time Raccoon reaches in and pulls Cricket out. And then we had the opportunity to address the fact that, well, just like Tommy in real life, Cricket is now not aware of his body in space and is knocking things over and bumping into everything because he's too wet. And he has to shake all that water off of his wings. And so we had Tommy come and act out, shaking water, okay, finding the, the wet, the back body, and then shaking it off the water so that he could find his body and move more in space. And so we, we worked on this together. Um, he also needed, he also met birds and other animals as we continued the story. We had more opportunities for him to need to use his body to accomplish certain things. For example, he got a chance to help a, a buffalo who needed water. So this time he gets to be the helper. The buffalo needs help and he gets to go and bring the water, but he has to carry it over his head like this. And we practice this together because when I ask him, Tommy, raise your hands up and hold the bucket of water. Well, his way of doing that is kind of like this. He can't connect to this movement, but we work on it and then we bring rhythm into it. So we kind of do a little stomping dance around the drum. And on the fourth, on the, one, on the first beat of every cycle, we're gonna raise our arms up straight. And so he was working through this body and space. Um, so, there's more, a lot more to Tommy and his progress, um, but I want to I want to keep moving so I could cover the last few things before we talk a little bit. Another tool is phonetic, melodic singing for focus and mental acuity. Um, I have found this particular scale to be a gem. Um, it's a raga from India called Hansa Dhani. And it's really simple. It just goes Sa Re Ga Pa Ni Sa Sa Ni Pa Ga Re Sa. And a pattern Sa Ga Pa Ni Sa Ni Sa Ga Re Ni Pa Ga Pa Ga Re Sa Ni Pa Sa. And the children that I have found who have really taken to this kind of thing where we're repeating a melodic pattern over and over again have been on the spectrum and have been, it, it's the organizing quality of melody that appeals to them on this level that, you know, they can, they can take something like this and hear it done over and over again, and it's not boring, it's actually compelling. Um, and then it really focuses the mind, it brings all of this um, attention deficit spread all over the place and harnesses it in one place and allows that channel to open. And working with teens. Um, here's a little slogan. Creme, changes, relevant embodiment message. These are the things uh, the teens are most tether most affected by right now and in their, that stage of their lives. 
changes. Their bodies are changing, their lives are changing, their minds are changing, their relationships are changing. Um, they need things which are relevant. They also need embodiment. They need to remember and find ways to stay connected with their bodies through these changes. And the messages, the message that they're being given and the message that they are also projecting outwards it's so malleable, it's flexible. And there are many directions that, can, that they can go in. And so to give them this empowerment that their message matters, that their message is being heard, and that it also can be experimented with and played with. That's where this music comes in and the songwriting part. It's wonderful to work with beat creation and lyric creation with teenagers. So I mean, beat creation, right? Hip hop. Hip hop is a winner with the teens. So even just the simple beat pad. Can you hear that? Okay, I'm just Yeah, there you go. All right, I'm not doing anything but look my finger just playing a MIDI keyboard with this. Okay, but when I set this up for teens in an office and they come in person, um, that's, you know, it just all flows out from there and allows some lyric creation, allows so much creation to happen, allows a message to be formed, a message to be expressed, and allows me to be cool and to be, you know, relatable. Um, notice I'm laughing. Yes, I like being cool for, for the kids. I like when they think I'm cool. It really helps in the therapy session. Um, so here's an example of a song. This song um, was sung, and this is uh, the recorded version, which was sung at a public event. So this is HIPAA compliant. Also through the agency I worked with, um, this teen, 16 years old, performed this song, and the way that I helped her develop this song was through many steps and many stages um, in which she worked with and agreed to be using a positive message and to speak about herself with respect in the song, to respect yourself, to be able to be embodied, to sing about the feeling of being in her body at this stage in her life. Yeah. Okay. You are the stars that paved the world. It can start from young. A boy or girl, I inspire you. So you can be brave. Y'all can look at me as a light in the cave. Every child is special with the joy they bring. Never be scared. Just let your voice sing. Put say your books. Yes, please wonder. Y'all can be the rain. I can be the thunder. And everybody here I give y'all my dedication. Stay in school, stay smart, get your education. Yeah. Okay. In this life, I'm going through changes, different girls, different bodies, different faces in my life. I want to go. So you hear that lyric? In my life, I'm going through changes, different girls, different bodies, different phases. Um, I think I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, so we've looked at uh, somatic, uh, creating the possibility for somatic awareness, using the toning using musical drones. We've experienced it a little bit. Um, we've talked about how that can create opportunities for somatic work. We've talked about attachment in the process, how it relates to um, teaching and fostering secure attachment. Um, we've talked about music therapy with children and different ways using um, different ways of approaching. And um, this is almost the whole lifespan, right? And I touched briefly on how music therapy works with older adults as well, or people in cognitive decline. So really, um, the work I'm doing is relevant to the whole lifespan. 
So, you know, when people ask, who do I work with? I would say everyone. Anyone who you think is a, is a good fit, who, who has a little interest in doing music and sound in, in therapy, um, I can work with. So that's about it. Um, I know we're, we're just at 630 now. Um, so I think I'd love to just open it up a little bit for um, any questions, feedback, anything anyone would like to share. Jeez, music therapy sure seems cool. <laughs> who's I think that? that's something I might be interested in. Now, let me let me get the gallery going. I can't see who's talking. That sounds certainly go. really, really interesting. I wonder if uh, it's a career path for me. Deborah Lack, is that you? Oh, wait, that's, hey. Hi, Professor Frazier. Benji, nice to see you. <laughs> Thanks for joining. Uh, yeah, this is my old student from New Paltz. Yeah. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah, Benji is a music therapy student. Yeah, Deborah's my yeah. mom. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Just wanted to say hello. Oh, good to see you, Benji. Thanks for joining good to us. See you, of yeah. course. Yeah. Very nice. Lucia, are you signing off? Is that your wave? Or okay. Yeah. I was waving at Benji to say hello. Okay. Make you feel welcome. We do have a comment in the chat box from Abby. Can you see that or do you want me to read it? Yeah, I see it. Thank you, Abby. That's really nice to hear. Thank you. I hope that, I hope it's inspiring. It's such a big subject, you know. Um, one hour doesn't give enough. But in somehow one hour, I think I try to demonstrate the possibility across lifespan of using music and music therapy. Yeah. Um, anyone like to share anything else or about Claudia the... had a raised hand? Yeah, I oh. just had a question. How do, you know, Claudia, I'm so bad at Zoom. I'm sorry. Yeah. I can't do uh, the raised hands, Claudia. No, it's fine. I got it. That's why I'm here to, to support you. Hold on, Carol. Um, Claudia had a raised hand. Oh. Um, I love the way you weave in the somatic work, Eric, um, mm -hmm. with the music therapy. To me, there's no absolutely no separation um as a musician dancer person mm -hmm. but it's uh therapeutically it's it takes a lot of skill set to incorporate them skillfully and effectively with clients so i really love hearing about the ways that, that manifests in your work and the examples you shared mm -hmm. um, that's really true yeah little no separate it seems quite um intuitive right i mean what do you think? Did you learn anything? Or is this all information that just kind of affirms what you probably already thought? Anyone want to share about that? There's tremendous learning. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. Carol, I see your hand is up. Okay. Um, I just wanted to ask, how are we going to get a link with access to the recording? Because I really enjoyed this. Um, yes, yes. It's yeah. Really important, yeah. share it with Sorry, somebody. Yeah, else. everyone will has access to the YouTube channel off our off our website, and I'm gonna upload it there in a couple days. Thank you. Seeing some familiar faces. Hi, Terry Watson, one of my original professors. Thank you for joining us. Of course, from one of your original professors, it took 45 minutes for me to get on. <laughs> okay. But Laura, Laura, help me. Yeah, and, and you Laura. Relentlessly help me. Shivani, hi. Nice to see you. Hi, this is wonderful. Thank you. Right. I do have one Laura. question. Yeah? Yeah, so uh, I know that you're an uh, amazing Mansuri flautist. Yeah. And my question is, uh, for those of us who have like a particular instrument that we love, like how does that come into play with your music therapy work? Yeah, that's a great question. I will be honest and I'll tell you that I do, do not use flute for almost probably 80%. So when I do, it's because it's really relevant. So I spend a lot of time on the keyboard, a lot of time with my guitar and, and with percussion. 
Thanks, Jennifer. Are you saying goodbye? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, does that answer, Shivani? Because I think, like, I think the 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 yeah, the the struggle and you know the challenge. I wouldn't call it struggle, but the 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 beautiful challenge is that um, with music therapy, we really have to find a way to engage the client in creating music. And this is one point that I've really had to explain to folks. Like when I was in India um, on a Fulbright for music therapy work, which I was creating a program at a school for children with special needs, um, everyone thought they knew what music therapy is. Music therapy is a big word in India, but it means to them that you lie there and get played for. Mm -hmm. And so music right. is therapeutic. Right. Okay, that is not what music therapy work is. That's sound healing. That's something else. So we get the clients into playing. And if it means that you sit and strum your guitar and sing a song that you would never play anywhere else, <laughs> that's that's what it is. Yeah. Yeah, I, um, Eric, I, you know, I play the French horn and I never use that in work and um, it's, it's way too much of an unrelatable instrument to, I, I work mostly with kids, you know, mm -hmm. uh, with guitar or keyboard or percussion, like, like you or singing. I do a lot of singing, which obviously you do, but mm -hmm. sometimes you just can't play your main instrument. No. Most yeah. And if I have to wear a mask, I, I can't play my flute. I've been trying. I can't figure it out. <laughs> Anybody can help you. You're not allowed. Yeah. It's not possible. Vicenza has a raised hand. Uh huh. Oh, hi, Vicenza. You're muted, oh, your Vicenza. Mute. You're muted, Vicenza. Oh, okay. So, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. At first, I was saying I, I got the memo what what color shirt to wear, um, but also I, yeah. I'm a therapist I'm an LCAT oh. also and it was really fun to hear um, the the music therapy side which of course you know it's almost like seamless because a lot of the work that I've done with with uh, children and adults also is really focusing on building relationship through rhythm and through sound and through movement and so it's it's kind of just hearing it from a different initiation point to get to the same place yeah um, but it's, it really like, you know, how you started with the breath is often how, you know, how I start with people. Mm -hmm. I start more with the breath with adults than with children. With children, sometimes it's easier exactly. to go right, right to sound and, yeah. and sound and movement together. Like you were talking about with the arms up and, you know, doing something yeah. like that and making a sound. And then yeah. once you've broken that barrier where we can be silly and make sounds, mm -hmm. you sort of, you can go, go anywhere from there. Really well, the the children, body. yeah, I, I really hear. I mean, first of all, right, movement and dance is musicking, in my opinion. It's, it's part. Of, it's part of being musical. And secondly, yeah. children, right? Yeah, children don't do the meditation thing in the same way. So, actually, children do everything through play. So, if you can find a way to play them into it, mm -hmm. um, absolutely. Yeah. And and the ritual piece also is something we did. Yes, there be um, it, it sort of start in the same formation or do something that they recognize. And, you know, when we do it again, it's like a ritual for the beginning and for the end. And, and so that structural piece also is very familiar. Mm -hmm. thank, you. thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'm glad to hear about your work. That's great. I saw Mr. Festa had his hands up. Hey there, Eric. Hi. Yeah, it's just very nice uh, to see the work that you do and, you know, playing out in real time in this time where we're not really seeing a lot of each other's uh, these days. So it's, um, yeah, it's really nice. The, the bridge between getting out of our heads and into actually physically collaborating with each other as you do with your clients, regardless of age, mm -hmm. is... Um, it's just a really nice bridge that that yeah i'm really grateful to see you know your work that you are doing and uh so thank you oh you're welcome thanks for being here and you know i feel it's good to be seen in the process 
Yeah, and this has given me all yeah. kinds of great ideas to implement yeah. and what we, we do over here. So, yeah, well, we'll, we'll talk soon. Yeah, that sounds great. Thank right. you. Lucia, were you wanting to share? Yeah, it's it's Lucia. So Lucia. That's okay, but I just uh, I wanted to um, to respond when you said when you were asking really sort of yeah, how was it blah blah, and um, I'm just looking back over my notes and you gave us a lot of uh, real specific you know examples and 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 you let us actually you you led us through actually you know doing some of this and that was playful for me and really fun and opened me up. Um, I do like singing and I find Kirtan, Kirtan has been a really wonderful uh, healing experience for me. And the fact that we can't do it so much right now with other people mm -hmm. has been, has been, you know, almost sort of like uh, so, so withering fun. away, you know, so it's so valuable to do this. I want to find, I want to find the Raga Hansadani. I know I've heard some people singing that. I just want to find it so I can start to practice that. But um, the also the Kirtan Kriya is another good one. I mean, uh -huh. this, these are practices one can do for oneself. But yeah. um, I just, I really appreciated all the specifics. I, I thought you were very generous in what you share with us. So thank you. Oh, that's great. Yeah. No, I really feel you. It's really hard now with this pandemic and music and it's really hard. And it's, I don't know what to say, but um, I want to share the PowerPoint with you and everyone. So we'll do that if you want it. So you can have those no musical notes that you can try. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. And we've got Claudia's raised hand. On mute. Okay. So I was wondering, Eric, um, how much work you do on Zoom and how you deal with um, the audio challenges. I yeah. About this women's group I've been running for about <clears throat> four years. And at the beginning, when we were meeting in real time and space, I did vocal toning with them. Awesome. And I was thinking maybe we should reintroduce that and they can turn off their mics and the yeah. my voice. And they'll be toning with me, but they won't be getting the other voices in the space because they cancel. Yes. How, how do you work with the canceling well, properties? Okay. Um, it's so much. Um, yeah. Um, you would need to ask them to turn their mics off. Um, synchronized singing in, in groups on uh, is impossible. Um, but I mean, sometimes what I've had to do if I'm playing a song, I just have to play it. And I want to hear the client, but if I listen to their rhythm, it's lost. So I really have to just completely anchor to what I'm doing. Um, so you kind of have to tune them out if you're going to hold the space. And it's not that great for you, you know, because it kind of feels weird musically. But, you know, you have to be a metronome. You have to be like a clock. Um, and then... As far as doing telehealth work, I do. And I actually um, really figured out some technical hurdles just by figuring out, you know, using two interfaces and I've got a laptop running through one and to the other so that I have direct MIDI, like, uh, for example, the beats I was using, right? That's going direct. Okay. Um, which is great for audio quality, but that you're not hearing that through microphone. That's a direct line, but it's coming from my laptop, which is going through here and going through that. And there's lots of cables involved and stuff. But for anyone who wants to try to set that thing up, I would be happy to, to talk you through it. And you might have to spend uh, a little money. I'm going to do a hard pass on that. <laughs> <laughs> but I love that you've done it. Yeah. <laughs> I just even just got into amplification of my instrument for the first yeah. time and I've been playing you know, since I was nine. So I'm like, whoa, yeah, play through a mic. Woo. No, it, it took me a bit to figure that out. I really had to think about it because um, I didn't, you know, I didn't want to use, um, I didn't want to have to buy a whole new computer, which is what I would have had to do to use uh, um, 
uh, what do they call it? There's a software that allows people to do this, but my computer is not updated for that. This is a 2009 model or whatever. Whoa. It doesn't run these softwares. Grandpa computer is what they call so, it. Yeah, so, so I have the analog set up. Like I have a beat up laptop and an old desktop and I made it work. You just retrofitted it, which was yeah. really. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Hey, Eric, yeah. I just, just uh, I don't see anyone else's hand raised, but just uh, on 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 this topic, I heard this interesting story um, on one of the radio shows, Radio Lab or something like uh -huh. that, where they did this. I think this was maybe the first year of the pandemic, but this choir, uh, this choir, they needed to sing. It's before the vaccine and everything. So um, they needed to sing together and then they needed to perform and they were all tuned in to, they drove their cars, <laughs> um, they drove their cars to one space and um, they were all uh, recording and also they were hearing each other on a radio station. So if you can make any sense of that, great, but I just thought I'd throw it out there, something that was pretty intriguing to hear how they were vocalizing in their car so they weren't you know spraying on other people uh -huh. and they were singing some opera or something like that no that they, you know <laughs> they've done it like on these late night tv They're shows crazy. but these are a big big budgets and oh, they yeah, have yeah, yeah. incredible technology that yeah yeah so it's possible i don't understand it I don't <laughs> I can't <afford> it. <laughs> but it just sounded cool to me to be in your car, yeah. you know, synchronized totally. sing, singing. Yeah. But yeah. I do some nice music um, with people from all over the world. Um, I'm in the UN orchestra and um, and the conductor. Do you guys ever hear about click tracks? I can't really explain it. Um, so you, the conductor gives you your own part and, and you record your part and then send it into him and then he puts it, he or she puts it all together. And we made beautiful music and was with people from all over the world. And then mm -hmm. we have these pieces. And so you didn't feel, you felt a connection, even though you were apart, you were together in the music. And I did that a lot. I mean, now, now we can start playing a little bit together. Now we can't again. We, there was a few weeks when we could play, but it was it was um, really a wonderful feeling to get that. You know, when he sent it to you, and and you you were playing with the same people you played with, you know, for years, and but apart, but together. It it made me. It made it was. I tried to explain music therapy to them and they didn't quite get it. <laughs> wow. That's nice. Yeah, it was beautiful. So you yeah, people still... have done some amazing stuff like that with the click tracks and, and then, yeah. you know, pre-recording and then someone goes and pieces it all together and yeah. you see everyone's face in a little box doing the, doing the stuff. I have a feeling though, you know, um, when this whole thing settles <laughs> down, um, that no one's going to want to do. I mean, it's not going to no, be very cool. <laughs> No, no one wants to do click tracks now. There was yeah. a there was that period of time before yeah. this last thing that we got to meet and play. You had to put, um, and you still you still drove hours to get to the city and park and. And, and you have to put a, you know, I'm playing the French horn and you have to put bell covers on all the blowing instrument had to put bell covers. There are shields, Eric, for flutes. Mm -hmm. I yeah, I, if you want me to show you. Oh, yeah. Think. Can you email there, me? I'm interested yeah. in that. Sure. I don't think I have your email, but I, I'm, I probably do have your, I do have your email. I have like a weird email of yours, an old one. Or use Facebook Messenger or something. <clears throat> okay yeah there are shields so the flute players were playing and so there was that few weeks you were together and it was amazing and then then it stopped you know allowed to play anymore and together um and no one nobody wants to do click tracks mm -hmm. 
we're tired of it. Absolutely. Ah. <laughs> so in the goodbye song that I do, there's a phrase and I turn it around um, in the middle. So it starts like this. It's time to say, oh, let me turn off the MIDI here. It's time to say a good bye to music. Da -da -da -da. We've had so much fun. And then here's where we say all the things we did, right? Like we sang my favorite song, whatever that may be. All right, and we jumped all around. And then the hook. I wish I could stay all day and play, but it's time to say goodbye, yeah. It's time to say a good to music goodbye everyone i'll see you next time thank you eric thank you leah for uh facilitating and for all to join the joined you're welcome i'm gonna stop the recording now all right <laughs>